is, uh, as, as you can see, we have uh, a number of members of our congressional delegation and our lieutenant governor up here. I, I welcome Senator Risch, uh, Representative Labrador, and our lieutenant governor, Brad Little, here with us. Uh, we will each make some remarks. We also have a special guest, which is uh, a big part of the reason that we are able to have this news conference here today, and that is Maya McGinnis, who is the president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Uh, this is a nonprofit organization that is very heavily engaged nationwide in trying to help not only America uh, and folks in Idaho, but the United States Congress to, to recognize the seriousness of the debt crisis that we face and the imminency of the debt crisis that we face and to uh, help Congress learn or find a path to solve this crisis. And we'll discuss that further. And then we'll throw it open for questions. Uh, I understand that this mic in front of me right here will be on at that point in time. And if you choose, you, you can come up and use the microphone uh, to ask questions. Um, uh, this is a news conference, so we invite the members of our news media to be um, uh, engaged in, and to work with us. And we appreciate their attendance and uh, participation here today. I also, I'm, I'm not going to try to introduce every elected official, official who is in the room, but there are a few uh, former and current officials, uh, just three that I am going to single out. I apologize to the rest of you that I, if I don't uh, single you out, but we are honored today to have uh, with us uh, the mayor of Boise, Mayor we, Mayor Beter. We appreciate you having you being here with us, and we are also honored to have two of our former governors. Uh, three. Oh yeah. <laughs> I think of you as Governor Rich. Uh, now I have to make a little side note here and say Jim and I are great partners in the U.S. Senate. We are. We are very good friends, and I apologize to Jim. Sight there. It's like my wife says, we'll talk about it. Uh, the, two, the two to whom I was referring are uh, former Governor, Governor Cecil Andrus. Cecil? Is he outside? Oh, there he is, right over here. And uh, former Governor Phil Bat. Phil? There's a, there's a bit of, uh, I, I think, an eloquence in the introduction of these two former governors uh, being with us because uh, it shows the bipartisanship uh, that we have, and that, frankly, that we need in this country in order to come to a a solution. Uh, what I'm going to do is I will make a few remarks and then we'll go in the order of uh, Senator Risch, Representative Labrador, and uh, Lieutenant Governor Little, and then Maya McGinnis will, uh, I was going to say back clean up, but that would be fifth position, so I guess uh, she'll, she will clean up and, and make her remarks and then we'll throw it open for question. I think the reason that we have such a large attendance here today is because Americans and especially Idahoans are increasingly understanding not only the seriousness of our national debt crisis, but its imminency. You've probably heard uh, people in political worlds talk about this problem for years. And you've probably heard it said by many that if we don't stop our profligate spending, the tax and spend policies in Washington, that our children and our grandchildren will, will have to pay a very heavy debt. Uh, well, that's true. Uh, but I think that talking about it that way actually creates the impression that the issue is a generation or a decade away. It's not. Uh, it could literally be months away. It is certainly only a couple years away uh, before we face the, the crisis. Now, the crisis will be when the world bond markets uh, come to the conclusion that the United States is not going to be able to service its debt. And we are incre increasingly close to that point. When, if we hit that tipping point, the ability to put together solutions will dramatically shrink. The amount of the, the damage to it, the economy will dramatically increase, and the American dream uh, could be lost. I, I think it's that serious a threat. I believe this is uh, the most serious threat that our nation has ever faced. Now, when I say that, some people say, you know, the Civil War was the greatest threat, or there are other World War I or World War II or other great threats. And certainly, I'm not trying to belittle those threats to our nation. Uh, but in terms, clearly in terms of an internal threat, there is no greater threat that we've ever faced, in my opinion. I do believe that the American dream is on the line. Uh, we are past the point where we can continue to simply try to tax and spend our way out of this problem. Uh, 
Many of you know that I served on the Bulls Simpson Commission, which uh, about a couple of years ago now, uh, put together a $4 trillion plan. This was a plan that over 10 years would reduce our debt posture, uh, reduce our debt that we would incur by $4 trillion. Um, that plan was one which was based on a, an agreement that we would recognize that spending was the biggest part of the problem and therefore should bear the biggest share of the solution. Uh, but that there was also a need to reform our tax code and generate a much stronger economy to take advantage of the opportunity that can exist in this crisis if we will take it, the opportunity to deal with our tax code. So we agreed to a three to one ratio, three dollars of spending cuts for every dollar of revenue. And uh, then as we moved forward and as the gang of six that I'm sure you've heard about uh, began refining the Bull Simpson process, uh, we moved forward to literally reform the tax code in a way that should generate a significant amount, if not all of that revenue, from growing our economy and finding other offsets or tax reductions in the code. You've often heard it said, uh, to broaden the base and reduce the rates in our internal revenue code. Uh, right now, if you tried to create a tax code that was more unfair, more complex, more expensive to comply with, or more anti-competitive to our own United States business interests, you'd be hard-pressed to do it worse than we've done it with our code, in my opinion. And we have an opportunity here in this crisis, if we will take it, an opportunity to create a tax code that is simpler, a broader base, fairer, and much more competitive to the United States business interests globally, and to generate an economic growth that will help us to deal with the revenue side of our equation in the solution that we need to put together. Um, we can take similar opportunities on the spending side. Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid are screaming at full speed toward insolvency. And I often say to groups that the worst option, people are battling in America now over how we should deal with this debt crisis and what a $4 trillion plan should look like. By the way, we, we now need probably a $5 trillion plan. And that plan will just keep our heads above water. We will need to be much more aggressive than even a $5 trillion plan over time. But we need to get started. And, and my hope is that we can, can get to that point. But the, what I often say to groups is, that of all the different approaches and ideas to how to solve these problems, and we do have a robust debate now starting in America about how to do it, the worst option of all is the status quo. The worst thing that we could do as a nation is to not deal with the problem. Because if we don't, then the bond markets will. And the day that that happens, then the problem will become much worse. The disaster in the United States economically will become much deeper. The time that it will take to build out of it will be extended significantly. And the opportunities that we talk about that we could take here will be significantly reduced. So uh, I, I'm hopeful that what will come out of today's press conference is a, a, an extension of the debate an increase in the number of people who are engaged and uh, willing to help participate in moving America to a solution with regard to this debt crisis, and, uh, and hopefully a solution soon to the problem. With that, let me stop and turn it over to my colleague, former governor, Jim Rich. Mike, thank you. Well, I'll thank all of you for coming today. Um, I, I hope the takeaway here today, and I think what Mike is uh, uh, attempting to do here, and I also, is to underscore uh, the seriousness of this problem. Uh, if you talk to any American, they will tell you, oh yeah, I think the country's in, in trouble. But nobody really knows how bad it is. Uh, uh, I would say only a small percentage of people know how bad it is. If you, uh, if, if I can tell you after having spent the time I have back there, is as bad as you think it is, it is substantially worse than that. Now let me give you a couple minutes, uh, uh, just a couple of minutes to try to convince you that. Everything in Washington, D.C. is done on 10 years basis. Now, I don't know who came up with that idea, but it's, it's ridiculous. Because nothing, they, all they do is talk about, well, they're going to do this, do that, and you find out everything happens in years 8, 9, and 10. And nothing happens in the, in the first seven years. So I think of it on a daily basis. Federal government spends, you, you've all heard the numbers, and these are very general round numbers. But for the fourth year in a row, feds are going to spend about 
they're only going to take in 2.2 and they're going to have to borrow 1.6 trillion dollars now everybody thinks well the federal government they got the printing presses they print the money they don't they borrow they really really borrow i went i've gone and watched them do it they do it multiple times a day it's called the bureau of public debt it's on ninth and eighth street in washington dc unfortunately you can't get in the media can't get in which is a, a travesty but it is real borrowing 3.8 2.2 1.6 let's put it on a daily basis because that's how i think about 11 billion dollars a day they write and they pay daily by the way because uh and this is on average by the way during the year but they pay daily because they it's so much money they have to pay daily so they pay about 11 billion dollars but but they only take in about six and a half billion so what do they do they go and they borrow four and a half billion dollars every single day 365 days a year three and a half billion dollars when i was governor of this state and uh and fell and, and ceased let me put this in perspective for you when i was governor the annual budget for the state of idaho was three and a half billion dollars for a year federal government borrows four and a half billion dollars every single day so let's let's say you take that that 11 billion at night and you start to say well let's pay the bills and see when we run out of money you would pay social security you would pay medicare not medicaid and you'd pay the interest on the national debt and you'd be out of money that's what that's what six and a half billion gets you then you got to go out and you got to borrow the four and a half billion dollars well you know it, it it's staggering it's absolutely staggering uh, the kind of problem this that this is now what are the solutions to it you, you know I, I i don't want to get any more partisan here than uh, than we need to but there's a lot of us believe it's a spending problem it's not a revenue problem and let me prove it to you the most liberal revenue pro uh, uh, proposal out there says let's let the current tax rates stand and, they, and by the way they all expire the, the end of the year let's let them stand for the middle class and for everybody else but we're going to raise the tax we're going to we're going to actually let the tax uh, cuts expire for the rich okay that's the most liberal proposal out there the one that they that they're trying to convince people it's going to save the world but let me tell you what that gets you if you do that according to those who are promoting it, say well, we would raise a trillion dollars yeah that's over 10 years in a year you raise 100 billion dollars what does 100 billion dollars get you nine days of operating the federal government nine days you got another 356 days you got to worry about the year after you raise the taxes on the rich as to what they're saying so that is i know one thing that is not the solution and i'm not i don't think any of us are here to protect the rich they take pretty good care of themselves but the but nine days is all you get with the most liberal tax raising proposal that's on the table my friends this is a really really serious problem it can't go on uh, i've been there only three and a half years and the, and the <laughs> national debt's gone uh, from uh, 13 or excuse me from 10 trillion up to uh, 16 trillion dollars and, and you say that and everybody looks at you but no because nobody knows nobody knows what 16 trillion dollars is uh, all I can tell you is that the people who we listen to that come into our caucus the economists be they liberal be they conservative Republicans Democrats whatever they tell us this can't go on and so then you talk about the solution and here we are but the solution has got to be that there there are going to have to be uh, very substantial cuts in federal spending. Let me close with this. Have, having been everything I've done in my life and having spent the three and a half years back there that I have, let me tell you something. I believe the federal government can't fix this. Only the American people can fix this. The American people built an economy that created the most successful, affluent culture on the face of the earth. We can do it again we can do it uh, we can get the uh, america out of this but the federal government's got to lower taxes lower regulations get out of the way and let us as americans continue to develop the economy we've got. thank you very much All right closer to it all right there's no switch um, you can see why uh, why it's such a pleasure to serve with the Idaho congressional delegation as, as uh, you can see how fired up we get about it uh, I ought to before we go to Raul Labrador 
I should also have mentioned that Mike Simpson would have been with us, but he's ill today, and he is also fighting very hard in Washington in the House of Representatives to make sure that we can uh, put together a comprehensive deal to deal with our debt. Also, I was told to announce that there's an overflow crowd, and we've made the, at least the audio from this uh, news conference available in the room right across the hall. So if you can stand not looking at us, you can go over and, uh, and listen to this in the hall if you can't find a seat over here. So with that, <laughs> I know, that was a joke. Uh, with that, let me go to Raul Labrador. Thank you, Senator, and thank you for putting this together. I'm actually a poor substitute for Mike Simpson. He's the one who was supposed to be here today. I'm just going to be very brief. Um, they have identified the problem that we're facing, and the reason we have a problem is because we have 10,000 new people retiring every single day, reaching the age of 65. We keep growing our spending. We keep growing the things that we're doing in Washington, D.C., and government's just getting larger and larger and larger. In the last 10 years, the government has doubled in size in the amount of spending that we're spending. Those are the things that we're facing today, and those are the things that we need to address in Washington. A lot of people here in the media and in other places get mad at me because I say that everything has to be on the table, and we need to stop picking winners and losers in Washington, D.C. We need to stop doing the things that we protect our states at the expense of every other state, that we protect our districts at the expense of every other district. And I've taken some pretty tough votes in Washington because I think everything needs to be cut and everything needs to be put on the table. But I'm gonna leave you with this. The other day I was speaking to, to a young woman in, in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and she said, you know, I've been talking to a lot, of the, a lot of congressmen, a lot of people in politics, and they're always really pessimistic. Why is it that you're optimistic? And I'm always optimistic because I have lived the American dream. I have watched my family live the American dream. I think America is the greatest nation on the earth. And if we all remember, and I'll finish with this, Winston Churchill once said, and I'm just going to paraphrase, Americans always do the right thing after trying everything else. <laughs> so Americans have tried everything else, and I think Americans will do the right thing by doing realizing that we have to cut spending, we have to cut regulations, we have to have energy independence, and we have to do the things that will make America once again prosperous and the greatest nation on the earth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Raul. Uh, you make a very important point there that everything must be on the table. And I think Americans are increasingly understanding that. Uh, if we can reach that level of consensus in the country, I think we can put the solution together. It's a, it's a key understanding, though, and, and frankly, many Americans don't yet agree that their part of whatever the budget is uh, should be a part of the solution, and that's one of the reasons why we're going around the country and, uh, and delivering this message. With that, let's talk to uh, an Idaho official, uh, our Lieutenant Governor, Brad Little. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Senator, and, and uh, to the delegation. Uh, I, I think it was uh, Simpson Bowles. I think I think it was Herschel Bowles said uh, the days of deficit denial are over. And uh, we all and a lot of people in this room I've talked to over and over about this. I, I think we are to that point. But the problem is we're, we we have not found the pathway to get out of that hole we're in. Um, just briefly, you know. When I talk to people, whether they be businesses or individuals, and, and this almost invariably is the first or second thing they want to talk about, besides maybe some specific issue. Um, it's all about certainty. What are taxes going to be? What's the inflation rate going to be? What's the value of the dollar going to be? Uh, what are, what's the inflation rate going to be? Uh, it will it be able to borrow money. What's the value of my home going to be? And they all tie to this, to this issue. Um, we've got, in the near term, we've got a fiscal cliff coming up at the end of this year that, that frankly, a lot of people call it a fiscal cliff. I think it's a road bump compared to some of the other, a speed bump compared to some of the other issues. If they talk about $16 billion, but if, you, if, if we require the federal government to amortize their Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid debt like we do an insurance company, the number gets to be an incomprehensible 70, 80, or 90 trillion dollars. And, and that's what I wake up at night thinking about all the hardworking men and women of Idaho and, and what that's going to be. But, but I, you know, my 
counsel and advice, what I hopefully reflect in the people that I talk to, is just give us a pathway. Just tell us what the pathway is. Uh, we can get there. As, as, as uh, several of you alluded to, uh, we have the ability to do this. Um, just for example, the 40% that, that you borrow right now, I shouldn't say you collectively, that we as Americans borrow, um, about half the money we spend in Idaho is federal money. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking in Idaho about the general fund, uh, but between the cities, uh, the counties, the state, uh, there's, there's about half of that that comes one way or another. Uh, the mayor knows about it, uh, that comes from federal money. If we just took away that 40%, uh, that would be a 15% in all government spending in the state of Idaho. But we went through a cut like that a couple years ago, and by and large, if we have the time, if we have the roadmap, we have a little rainy day money where we can do it, we can do that. We in the state of Idaho, and I'm speaking only for the Lieutenant Governor's Office and my massive budget and huge staff, um, <laughs> that, that we, we can take a 15% cut, our share of what we're borrowing right now, if, if we've got enough time to plan for it. Um, there's some other parts of the federal government, and, and that at least would put us at a net zero uh, gain, uh, but that's a start. But I, I think the reaction of the consumers, of the individuals, of the families and the businesses to roadmap going ahead would be such a dynamic economic force that a lot of that growth we need, because we have to continue to grow the economy. There's, if, if we absolutely stop growth in the economy, uh, our ability to get ahead of this curve to change the direction of these lines, the trajectory of the debt goes away. So I wish I came here with a great answer. Um, uh, I, know, I know it's going to take uh, uh, a lot of minds that are coming from different areas and have different constituencies having to come together. but. The time is short before we have to have a pathway going ahead, and that's, that's uh, Senator, that's what I hear from people of all walks of life and businesses all over the state of Idaho is, we know what we have to do, just give us a pathway, and, and I, the only thing I can guarantee about it is nobody's going to like it. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much, Brad. Um, your comments are truly uh, meaningful to me because as you just said, the state can do it. The state government can do it and can participate. It's an attitude, attitude like that that I pick up from Idahoans across the board from every walk of life when I talk to them. They tell me, look, we understand the threat we face and we understand that everything's got to be on the table. We simply ask that it be fairly done. And I think that's the responsibility that Cong one of the major responsibilities that Congress has to face in trying to work out uh, this solution. As I said, not doing something will be the worst option we could pick. And with that, uh, let me turn to Maya McGinnis and give her just a, a short introduction. Uh, as I indicated earlier, Maya is the president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Government. Now, this has been around, this nonprofit organization has been around for 20, 30 years, uh, but recently has become, I, I think, the major player on, the, on, on a uh, non elected official basis. Uh, in the United States in terms of trying to facilitate putting together a comprehensive solution to our debt crisis. And correct me if I'm wrong, Maya, but the, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Government doesn't necessarily push any particular solution, any particular plan, but is working to do everything it can, A, to educate the country, and B, uh, to then help facilitate our policy uh, makers in Washington, D.C., and others in the states and other parts of the country to help put together uh, the momentum toward achieving a resolution of this problem and, and putting a deal together. And um, Maya does and will be uh, traveling uh, around the country uh, working with people and, and uh, is currently engaged in a very, very uh, extensive effort on behalf of not only the committee but on behalf of America to try to take this message to the country and uh, Idaho is the first stop on your trip. We appreciate you. Uh, I call it a trip, first stop on your endeavors, and we appreciate you uh, selecting Idaho as your, your first uh, as you move around the country to help us uh, put together a solution. Now with that, let me turn to Maya McGinnis. 
Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, and I won't keep my comments short because so many important points have been covered. Um, but it is terrific to see people come out today because I think the clear first step in all of this is having a national, a real national discussion about what it's going to take to fix the debt. Um, and an acknowledgement of that it's going to be hard. Um, so the starting point. <laughs> okay. The starting point, um, we face the most predictable crisis we could know. We know we are hurtling towards a tremendous debt-driven crisis in this country if we fail to act. Um, and and this, the situation with the deficit and debt are so serious on so many different fronts, right? If you think about how the massive amount of borrowing that we've been doing for so long, far too long in this country affect us, they affect the economy in that they make it um, so much more difficult to borrow and invest, whether it's in your family or for your small business or for the major businesses that are kind of the backbone of this economy. They take that money and the government borrows it and it's not available for private borrowing at the same cost. Um, they affect your household, so it affects how, it's a kitchen table issue so much more than I think people realize. In fact, that the fact that it has a profound effect on how much it costs to send your children to school, to borrow for a home, uh, to plan, to know what you have going forward as you are planning um, for all the things, retirement, um, whether you want to take time off from work to raise a family, those things are affected by the stability and the economic environment of the deficit and debt. They affect the next generation, right? There is no greater calling in this country than our job is to leave the country stronger and better off for the next generation, for our kids. And basically, what we've been doing for years, it's this simple, is we have been saying, we're going to spend money on a lot of things, and we're not going to pay for it. And we are going to give that bill to the next generation. And it's reached the point where, because that money hasn't been spent in ways that have grown the economy, we face the very real risk of handing the, generate, the next generations you know, a much weaker economy. And that just shouldn't be acceptable to any of us. Um, we face a real, I think, risk in sort of getting this economic recovery back on track. So the debt issue and the jobs issue are so related in that we will not have a recovery until we have the stability of kind of a multi-year debt deal that's in place and people understand, and importantly, businesses understand what they can plan for so they can start investing and hiring again, which is such a core part of this recovery. Um, and then the, the final risk that wasn't really true so long ago, I don't think, is we're bumping up against the real likelihood that we could have a fiscal crisis in this country. And that is just sort of, it's, it's the most self-imposed damage we could do to our country is to actually have the kind of crisis you've seen in other countries that you never thought would come here, but where suddenly interest rates are soaring and we can't get up ahead of the problem. Um, and so there are many threats of not making changes. Secondly, we face this fiscal cliff at the end of the year, and that means we need to get our act in order quickly. We need to figure out how we're not going to let all these tax cuts expire and the sequester hit. But we also need to figure out how we're not going to do what, unfortunately, no offense Washington folks, I guess I'm a Washington folks, but what we see so often, which is we punt. We cannot punt when it comes to the slam duck. We have to use this moment to move forward in figuring out how to fix this problem. Um, and then finally, I think one of the challenges we face is that we all have different choices of how we would fix the problem. There's no question that things are polarized in Washington right now, and people have different choices about how they would fix it. Um, but the truth is, the thing worse, and I think you all made this point, the thing worse than, than putting in place a plan that's not your first choice or your favorite plan would be if we fail to make changes. And if we are hit with some kind of fiscal crisis, if we wait so that we don't get to make these kinds of changes on our own terms, but so that they're forced upon us by our creditors, uh, that, is, that is just a really damaging situation where nobody will preserve all the core values that they're trying to get in place. So what I think the good news is, we actually do have the kind of sense of what needs to happen. We know that a deal has to be big enough to fix the problem. And five trillion, I think that's right, it has to be at least five trillion in savings over 10 years. Otherwise, it won't actually be a real fix. We know that we have to address the core problems in the budget. Healthcare costs are growing so fast, they're squeezing out all the other parts of the budget, they're costing all of us too much. The aging of the, the population, which you mentioned, puts huge massive pressures on the budget. We have to figure out how to do that. And we have to reform the tax code. Um, and, and perhaps the terrible shape that the current tax code is, is in gives us the opportunity to reform it in a way that can help the fiscal situation and grow the economy. Um, but the big point you made, the truth is, any deal that saves $5 trillion is going to have plenty of it, plenty of things in it, 
that we're all going to hate because it is not going to be fun to put together a $5 trillion deal that saves money. Because what we've been doing for so long is all the easy part, you know, the borrowing, that's easy. This is really kind of paint piper, and it's going to be very difficult. And we're going to have to find a way to bring the country together so that instead of fighting about the parts we don't want, because there are plenty of things we will all not want, we're willing to do this in time uh, before it's forced upon us. So what we're doing is we've, we've launched this campaign. It's the campaign to fix the debt. Um, we are working with members in Congress. We're going to the states. We are building business associations and former members of Congress and community activists, all different points of view, trying to facilitate a discussion that people have because guess what? People are going to disagree. The AARP is going to have a different opinion than different groups and the, the Tea Party and the other people. Many of the people who have helped put this issue on the agenda aren't going to have the exact same solution, but what we can't do is let ourselves not have any solution at all. So we're going to try to have that discussion in as many ways as possible and really push Congress to fix the debt. Because if we don't do this quickly, uh, we're going to have that fix pushed upon us. So my hope is that as we go around and talk to people, we'll hear from people about what the best way to proceed on this is, but we'll also acknowledge the realities that this is going to be something that if we fail to act, the consequences of an action are so serious for the country. But if we do put a plan in place, that is going to strengthen the economy, that is going to grow the economy. We can do so in a way that preserves the core values of a strong economy um, that protects people who depend on different, different programs. We can do it in a way that preserves a lot of the core values by doing it on our own terms rather than waiting too long. So my hope is that working with great members of Congress who've really led this discussion uh, and working with people across the country, we can show members of Congress that we want them to act and not delay on this. Thank you. Now that you've, we've had an opportunity to make our statements, we have built in some time here to do some questions and answers. And uh, if there are those of you who would like to ask a question, please come forward. I see hands coming up all over. Why don't you kind of get lined up here to ask a question at the microphone? Turn the microphone on. Oh, there is a mic. There is a thing. <laughs> Goes up and down. Oh. First of all, I want to thank you all for coming here servicing this issue that uh, we in the business community know is right in front of us. My name is Terry Jones, I'm from Emmett, I'm a dairy farmer, I have met you all personally in years past. Um, I go to the bank, the first thing he says is, what's your budget? Mia said here just moments ago, we need to fix the budget. Did you say there's me why we haven't had a budget for three years? Two words, Harry Reid. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you. Sir. You can only vote on uh, what Harry Reid puts on the uh, on the table. What we did is we forced a vote uh, because there's an Arcanian rule that allows the minority to force a vote on the president's budget. So we voted on the president's budget. It got zero votes. None from the Republicans. None from the Democrats. We have a uh, uh, the House that's in charge that the Republicans are in charge of have voted uh, since the Republicans have been in charge and put a budget on the table every year. We can't do that in the Senate. Uh, that's all I can tell you. you know, and it's a, uh, the only thing I would add is at the same time we were able to force the vote in the Senate, and that's, you're right, we haven't had a budget in the Senate for three years. And it's because of this gridlock that Jim just described. Uh, but uh, part of it is that, that Senator Reid does not want to have to force those kind of tough votes on, on his caucus right now, in my opinion. But at the time we were able to force a vote on the President's budget, we also voted on two or three other budgets, including the House budget. Uh, none, of them, none of them got the votes necessary to pass. It's a, it's a terrible, terrible circumstance in the Senate. We, Mike and I both voted for the Paul Ryan budget when we got a yeah. chance. In fact, I think both of us voted for the Pat Toomey budget, which is a little more conservative. Even Ryan's budget only down, never balances. We got one that balanced in uh, 10 years or 7 years of Pat Toomey budget. Good afternoon. Uh, I guess you know me, but um, for the audience, Wayne Hoffman, the Executive Director of the Idaho Freedom Foundation. A number of our members in the room, and, and of course we, we work diligently and try to promote free market principles, and I'm glad to hear whenever I see a, a member of Congress talking about free markets, it just, it warms my heart. Uh, but I also wanted to ask, uh, we're talking about entitlement spending, and a lot of what we do at Freedom Foundation is, is geared toward what happens here in this building at the state legislature and the governor's office. 
And next legislative session, we'll be confronted with um, whether the state should create a state health insurance exchange uh, and whether to expand Medicaid. Now, on both those issues, the insurance exchange is the vehicle by which billions of dollars in new subsidies, new entitlements, will be transferred by virtue of paying for uh, insurance premiums and providing tax breaks to people who buy insurance premiums. The other on the uh, Medicaid expansions, we're being told if you do the expansion to Medicaid, you'll have 100% uh, of this paid for by the federal government over the next three years. And I'm very skeptical of that. I think people ought to be skeptical of it. I think the legislature should, the governor should, but I want to hear your opinion on those two issues. Well, Wayne, I'll start out. Uh, I, too, am skeptical of that. There is a promise in Obamacare uh, of a three-year, 100% federal deal. You remember, that's, I think, what uh, Ben Nelson got the Nebraska exemption on, if I remember right. Yeah, um, which caused a lot of the understanding in America to focus on the fact that uh, there was a huge cost element being pushed off onto the states. Uh, I don't think that anybody can trust that the federal government will continue to pay 100% of the increased cost that Obamacare puts out in, in its plan uh, after that three-year period. I, I think that states will have to assume that they're going to begin assuming increasing portions of that, if not all of it, rather rapidly. And the, the numbers we had before us at the time we were doing the debate over the Obamacare legislation indicated that most states would literally be bankrupted over a period of time if uh, that were to happen. So I think you have very legitimate cause to be very concerned. Well, I didn't vote for that stuff in the first place. That was part of Obamacare. Uh, I would say this, I, uh, you know, I spent almost 30 years in the state senate um, and, and sometime as governor and lieutenant governor. I always hated people from Washington, D.C. coming and giving me advice as to what to do in the state. So you got a lot of state legislators in here. I'd lobby them. I didn't vote for it. Um, I guess they can either follow my uh, my lead or not, but uh, I'm, I'm not going to tell them what to do. I don't think anybody from Washington, D.C. ought to come and tell the state what to do. Wayne, well, you know, I have made it pretty clear that I have advised the governor and the legislators to really look closely at the exchange issue because I think the media and some people are misleading the state, trying to make them believe that this is a true state exchange. As you know, Utah had a state exchange, and they're being told now that their state exchange does not comply with with Obamacare. So I'm. I'm not going to tell the state what to do. They, they can make their own decisions, but I have done the best that I can to let them know what is hidden in Obamacare, because there's some major problems that we have with Obamacare. It's going to increase the cost of a lot of different things. And, and let's assume for a second that, that the, the Medicaid issue is funded 100%, which I don't believe, by, like the Senate, I don't believe it will be, but let's assume for a second. That's 100% of 42% that's being borrowed every single day. I think Jim did a very good job of explaining how much we're borrowing, said, is that really what we want? Do we want to incur more debt in the United States to expand that program? And these are all questions that need to be asked, and the state legislators, jointly with the governor and the lieutenant governor, need to make these, these decisions. But the only one who has a, a say on some of these things is uh, sitting right here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Jim. We appreciate it. Jennifer Carter, I'm from Boise, Idaho. Um, before I ask my question, I just want to correct. There is no Obamacare. It's the Health Care Affordability Care Act. It's, it's not Obamacare. That was, heard, that was made up by people to have a negative connotation that didn't want to vote for it. And so by using the word Obamacare, it's misleading. Can I correct you for a second? Okay. It's the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, and Obamacare neither protects patients nor, nor, nor makes affordable care. The Please issue uh, was you do think <laughs> As elected officials, you're using the term Obamacare over and over again, and I just wanted to make sure that if we're going to talk about legislation, let's do it properly. At any rate, to actually to quote you, you said too many people are retiring, everything needs to be cut on the table. A figure that was thrown out is that the um, federal government borrows four and a half billion a day. The liberal um, solution is to expire tax cuts for the rich. You say that that would only provide a hundred billion dollars per year. And that's only nine days of federal spend, spending. Who in this room wouldn't want $100 billion only? So, 
So does that justify not getting those tax cuts because it's only a hundred billion dollars? Just a point. The other question, the only other thing I have to say is this: if everything, Senator Labrador, is on the table, and everything, shouldn't that also include, in addition to cuts, redistributing funds that help get the Americans on their feet be considered, like access to health care, better education, safe drinking water? services to help families provide their children with tools needed to be productive and adequately prepared to help Americans get on its feet. Cutting across the board is to take away access to social services, including health care and improving education. And that means we're essentially cutting off two legs of a three-legged stool. And people in the middle class feel like the government is cutting off the legs of the middle class, so we remain paralyzed while the richest appear to have grown extra legs because they're moving rather quickly, and we're not. So all we're ever hearing is about cutting. And I'd like to know, with your solution, bipartisan, in a bipartisan fashion, let's talk about redistributing. There's a lot of spending going on, and it's not going to the people who elect you. Let me take the first cut at that. I'm sure there's probably a lot who want to jump into that. But uh, the bottom line here is, this is not going to be easy. Uh, and, and the fact is that everybody would like to just go on, I don't know that everybody would, but a lot of people would like to just not solve the problem. But for every issue that you pointed out, uh, as I said earlier, the, the status quo is going to damage that particular interest worse than doing nothing. So then the question is, uh, should everything be on the table? I do believe it should be on the table. That does not mean that Congress should not engage in prioritizing. There are some federal programs that should be 100% cut, eliminated, and removed from the budget. There are, there are other federal programs that have some justification. We can all you know, debate among ourselves about which ones those are. Some should be not totally eliminated, but significantly reduced. Others maybe should be held frozen at current levels for a period of years. There are some that may need to be enhanced. Like education, perhaps. And, and we can all take, you know, point out our priorities in that process. But the, the, the suggestion that everything has to be on the table and everything must, to some extent, share, take its share in the solution to the problem uh, does not mean that it has to be pro rata across the board. It means that Congress should still have the opportunity to make judgments about where priorities should be. And we may or may not agree with where those judgments are, but the bottom line is that we need to achieve certain levels of reduction of our debt, or every program that we see is going to have much more serious damage done to it. So are you saying that redistributing funds is also on the table in addition to I don't know what you mean by redistributing funds. If you mean setting priorities, yes, but if you're I, saying... I heard from Senator Labrador, everything needs to be on the table and everything needs to be cut. There needs to be cuts everywhere. And I'm saying there are some programs like educating our children and health care that needs to get revamped and funded. Other things like military spending, one could argue, may need to be changed. That's not my fault, it's yours. What I'm saying is, is is thinking through and not just eliminating everything on the table. If, you're, if your question is, uh, must Congress set priorities and th some things be given greater priority than others in the budget? The answer is yes. Uh, if, if the question is, uh, should there be some programs that are totally exempt from participating in the solution that we put together, probably not. Uh, probably they would, I don't know that there is a program that can expect to achieve the same rate of budget support that it has in the past decade. I mean, we just don't have the financial resources to do it. And, and, and you, you ask a really important question, and, and I think this is what people don't understand about the federal government. You keep mentioning education. In my opinion, the federal government should have no role in, in education. And it should be done at the state level. And I'll tell you why. Washington, D.C. continues to, to tell Idaho, this is how you should spend your federal money. They act like the money comes from them, like it doesn't come from the taxpayers. If we actually allow this money to come here locally, and we could create our own rules and regulations on how to spend that money, we could use it much more efficiently. There's estimates out there that we're actually wasting between 10 and 20 percent because of all the federal mandates. 
that we have. You, it's the same thing in education, it's the same thing in road building, it's the same thing in all these areas. With the same amount of money that we're spending right now in education, we could actually get more done if we could control it at the state level. So those are all the priorities that we need to realize. I think you and I, I have five children in the school system. So it's not like I want to cut education. I want them to have clean water, clean air. I want them to have all those things. It's not like I'm, I, I want the world to, to be a worse place. I want the world to be a better place. But experience and history shows me that when we allow the free market to work, when we allow people to thrive, to get let government get out of the way, government actually receives more revenues, not less revenues. And we can actually do the things that we need to do to make America prosper. So thank you. I think right. you listen to the voters. Thank you. I hear you. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you. I, we try to listen to the voters. Uh, and uh, with all due respect, and I do respect your point of view, I'm, I'm in total disagreement with it. I don't want anything to do with a government that even thinks about re redistributing assets and property. Good afternoon, my name is Jeff Wright from Boise County. Um, I guess, you know, it would, with all due respect to the panel, I have a, a, a slightly different take on where we sit at in the situation. I first got directly involved with this more than 15 years ago after uh, Congress passed the Budget Act that allowed, uh, that allowed them to start borrowing from the 24 surplus funds uh, in the budget to buy down the deficit. It was obvious at that time that this problem was on the horizon. Um, the math currently involved at where we sit right now between unfunded liabilities and, on, and, and principal liabilities right now uh, probably forecloses, if you'll excuse the worst of, use of that word, forecloses much of what people think we can do from here on out. A lot of our efforts are going to be generated, um, unfortunately for the previous speaker, uh, simply by the physics of economics. Um, and I don't think there's going to be a hell of a lot come out of the, out of the wing duck session uh, before the end of the year on the seven major items that have to get put to bed before December 31st. But my question goes down to, and I asked this of General Peter Pace in September of 2008 at a conference in Colorado Springs when he was outgoing Joint Chief. And I asked him and I said, I said, General, could you, and this was 2008, I said, what, are you, what, are you, what is the Defense Department going to do uh, the day that the Treasury cannot sell a T-bill to the open market? What are they going to do? Okay, well, the same applies to the, the welfare side of the equation as it applies to the warfare side of the equation. And I don't think that there's the choices that are left here and the options that, that are on the table are going to preclude uh, much action. So my question is, is that, and, and I think Governor Otter and the Lieutenant Governor took a step in the right direction when they told the departments and agencies, you better look at a budget cut coming. Okay, but it's going to be a, it could be a lot worse than than 15, 20 percent. So my question is, with all the entanglements between the state agencies and the federal agencies and the portion of the budget, uh, I would like to hear from both state and federal elected officials how exactly we're going to disentangle ourselves the day we cannot sell a T bill to the open market, and the only place we can sell it is the Federal Reserve. It's a good question. We need, we're to the panel up here, we need to give quicker answers because we've only got about 10 or 11 minutes left and we've got a lot of people standing in line. Uh, yeah, yeah let me, uh, first of all, I wish every American had, a, had an understanding like you do of uh, what's going on at the federal level. Uh, I can't answer the question of what's going to happen when they can't sell T-bills. Uh, well, I went and watched the auction when they did this. They do it for 30 minutes. Most of the bidding takes place in the last 10 minutes. And I asked them, I said, what happens if you don't get cover? And they all laughed and they said, well, that's, that's, uh, that can't happen. It's never happened before. And, uh, and I said, well, what happens when you push the button and nobody will loan you money? And they said, Senator, if that happened, they said every market in the world would freeze up in moments, including our own. Where do you go from there? I don't know where you go from there. But I asked them, I asked them how close they've ever come once they came within 28 seconds of not having cover in the uh, fall, early fall of 2008. But I 
that, that's too that's too antiseptic of thinking about this. I mean, uh, you're you're thinking about one very small aspect of what happens when things freeze up. I mean, this is this is going to be systemic through America. And it's going to be systemic through the world if indeed they can't sell the United States money. We'll let Maya have the last word here. Well, and the, the situation you're describing is how a fiscal crisis begins. <laughs> so what happens is if you can't sell those treasuries, they just offer to pay more because the federal government gets the first dibs on dollars. And this is how interest rates suddenly start to spike up and you have a crisis. And just to quote a number we were talking about today, for every one percentage point increase in interest rates, it would add over a trillion dollars in interest payments we would over, owe over the next 10 years. So we are talking about how to get a $5 trillion deal. The super committee, you'll recall, was unable to come up with just over $1 trillion in savings. Every one percentage point increase will add a trillion to our bill for nothing but interest payments. And this is just one of the points why if we wait until markets force us to do it, not only, the federal government will get its money, it will be paying much higher rates, but none of us will be able to borrow, businesses will not be able to borrow, and the recession that we just saw will be nothing compared to kind of the crisis we would put ourselves in in that scenario. Yeah, that's probably true. Yes, sir, you're next. Thank you. Um, I'd like to be more specific. Uh, subsidies for ethanol and other renewable projects. The 1603 program has given Idaho wind developers over 300 million in the last three years. And yet in committee, the finance committee recently, you voted in favor of renewing that. How does that square with reducing the budget? Well, in, in that... In that particular context, it was an extension of, I think, 40 or 50 of our business tax exemptions that are, are I thought, critical for our industry right now. We tried to weed out some of them. Some got weeded out. Some didn't. And, and so I had the tough decision. And it was one of those close calls for me as to whether to vote against the package because it wasn't as perfect as I wanted or whether to vote for it because it had a lot of very powerful and I thought pro-business tax policy in it. I ultimately decided to vote for it, but you're right, there are provisions in it, some of which you've identified. Actually, the ethanol provision was not in that one, but there were provisions in it that I think could be cleaned out, and ultimately we will clean them out. And can I just make a quick break, a point on that as well? Those are the kinds of tax breaks, and there are many, many more of them, and there are many that are popular and that affect all of us. But if you are willing to truly contemplate how you're going to get rid of those tax breaks, the credits, the deductions, the exemptions, and the exclusions, we can broaden the tax base and bring rates down so much lower. In Simpson Bowles, they looked at something called a zero plan. Well, what if you just got rid of all tax breaks and you could bring the rates down, I believe it was 23. 12, and the highest rate would be 23. I mean, massive reductions in rates, which would just open up a huge growth for because of the lower rate reductions and be able to use a lot of money to also close the deficit. So there are going to be tough calls on tax breaks, but if we're going to talk about real tax reform, that's exactly where we're going to need to look. And Maya makes another good point. The, the bill that we put out will keep the, the uh, current tax structure uh, from being picked apart without achieving rate reduction at the same time. I think it's very critical. And as I said earlier in my remarks, we need to reform our tax code. But we need to reform it in a way that just doesn't just raise taxes for everybody, but instead utilizes the revenue from the reform to reduce rates. And, and the, the, the opportunity to do that was preserved by the vote that I cast. It's not going very well. <laughs> You, you have a lot of special interests, and this is why I actually agree with, one of the things I agreed on with the Simpsons Bowles Commission is to go to zero everything out. I believe completely that we need to get rid of all the tax breaks and actually lower the rates significantly, and then we can have a debate about every specific tax break individually, and people will know, if I give this group a tax break, that means everybody's taxes are going to be raised over here. And, and make that make have that debate in Washington DC It's one of the most frustrating things I have had over the last year and a half I assumed that we were going to have a vote on on a, a, a clean bill on day one that we were in Washington DC and we didn't and I'm going to disagree with you Maya a little bit on the lame duck session I think that is the worst possible time for us to have this debate uh, during the lame duck session if you look at the last three or four lame duck sessions 
what the American people have not come out on top in every one of those lame duck sessions. I think we have had major problems. I think we need to let the election happen. And in January, the American people will make a decision in November. They will decide whether they want to go down the same path that we're on uh, or whether they want to have a new government in Washington, D.C. I believe and I hope that we're going to have a new government in Washington, D.C., but that decision will be made by the American people, and I don't think people who will be unelected by the time of the lame duck session should be making decisions that will affect the future right. of America. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll make the point. I've always thought that about the lame duck. You don't get the other way out to make the massive decisions. My only concern is if we don't do something during the lame duck, we're going in hurdling over a fiscal cliff right into a recession. Or if we extend all these policies and Congress does what it does too often, just says, well, we'll ignore kind of constraints we put on ourselves, we will be downgraded. Right? We will be downgraded. Uh, and we will pay a huge price. So I don't think we should make the major decisions in the lame duck. We need time to do that in an open process. But we have to do something that shows we're going to take the first step to treating this as the real problem this time. No more punting. And, and I agree with that. And I think it should be done the first quarter of, of, of the year. What, whoever is, is in charge needs to make these tough decisions. All right, we've only got about five All minutes right. left. Let's go ahead. Uh, Gary Smith, Star Idaho. Um, number one, I want to thank you for doing this. and. <clears throat> Lieutenant Governor, I would appreciate it if this audio could be made available to the people of Idaho. I believe it is. We're streaming on the internet right now, and I believe the audio will be made available. If we can have that, that would be great because this work, this, what you people have done and to get the word out to get people concerned it needs to be spread throughout all of Idaho and I understand you're going across the country. And my question is about waste and fraud. I know there's a lot about cutting back and things. But there is so much waste and fraud that we read about every day that I don't understand. It just doesn't make sense. Two weeks ago, I read about $5 billion being written by the IRS last year to fraudulent tax returns. $5 billion. One household got over 600 returns sent to it. If I try and sign up for Costco for a second password, they won't let me in. <laughs> That's but, true. I mean, it sounds funny, but there is so much that we hear about this every day. And what I don't hear about and what I'm asking you is that when that hits the press, I expect within two weeks to see a list of people that have been arrested or action that has been taken. It seems like we read about it and nothing happens. So I would ask you to take this back. If there is not a fraud committee or if somebody is not checking on this, that should be the first thing you do. There is so much with $5 billion in one year to fraudulent tax claims. It's ridiculous. Um, Agreed. We did it in the state of Idaho. The governor and the lieutenant governor, I'm not sure exactly, and I don't have the details, but we put together a group of people to go back and look at tax returns, and I think, lieutenant governor, it was like 14 to $16 million that was found, money that was due to the state of Idaho. We should be doing the same thing at the federal government. I have made jokes about this, that if you would give me 10% of everything I recover, I'll set up a business tomorrow, give me the same privileges of the IRS to go in and start looking through every agency, you could do it. And just one last point on the agencies. In this very building, I was at a, a committee meeting and someone brought up about the EPA. And what would happen if we did away with the EPA? And there was a gentleman from Fish and Game there, and we asked him, we said, do you think the people of Idaho would immediately go out and start dumping trash, oil, and things into it? And he said, no, we wouldn't allow that to happen. This is Idaho, the people of Idaho wouldn't look. So I agreed with education. I believe the number was like, of every dollar we send to the Federal uh, Department of Education, we get 66 cents back. That's crazy. That is absolutely ridiculous. We should be using that and doing it here at our own level. So, thank you very much for this and thank you. making the audio. And by the way, I'll do, we are really out of time and we're going to have to leave in just a few minutes, but I, I just wanted to say on the waste, fraud, and abuse and the duplication that we have in Washington, it's not something that's unknown it, and, and we are working to to uh, aggressively put that on the table. As you might know, the gridlock in Washington is keeping us some progress on that. But that's uh, That would be the headline that I would like part. to see. Those 600 people in one account, one house that did that, I'd like to see that money return. Now, for those who are still in line, we obviously, I apologize, are not going to be able to get through all the questions. We can probably just do a, another one question. I apologize because we all have, have other places that we cannot avoid. So, uh, yes, ma'am, do you have a suggestion? I do, actually. Uh, there's a town hall being held this Friday at the Capitol Steps. Each of you have been invited. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Representative Simpson couldn't come. 
but I would encourage others who have things that they want to say to attend at 5 o'clock this Friday. Okay, that's a good thing at 5 o'clock this Friday. And for those uh, behind the gentleman who's in the front of the line right now, I apologize, we won't be able to get your questions here. But if you will uh, submit your questions, you can submit them to our office, Lindsay, and we can get them to the other members of the panel, and we will get you answers to your questions. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, one of the problems we always have in a town meeting format like this is uh, we run out of time before we run out of interest in, in questions. So I apologize to those who won't get to ask your questions today. Um, but yes, sir, you'll, you'll get the last question. And, uh, nice to see you all here. Thank you for coming. Uh, I just have two quick things. One, every time the government makes it available... Can you lean down a little bit there? I just have two things. Um, one, every time that there's been more money available for the government, and this is at all levels. Um, I don't know if you remember, Senator Rich, I came to you 20 years ago and suggested that you stop the spending growth. Um, and I, at that time, I proposed a by percentage that the, that the government government could only grow at a percentage as fast as the, as the economy. Um, and your, your answer to me was, well, what will we do with all the extra money? <laughs> but, but anyway, every time there's, there's more money available, it gets spent. And I've seen this at the city level, the county level, the state level, the federal level. Um, why can you guys not go back there and immediately cap the dollars that you're spending? Don't spend any more next year than you spent this year, and start there. You know, the, the, the special interests, you know, are going to scream, you know, at, all over the place about their cuts. Um, so don't start with cuts. Just start with stop the spending. You know, right where we're at, um, the economy grows even when it's even when it's in a sad shape it's at now. It, it grows. Um, so if you could just take that step as a place to start, then go back at the cuts. <laughs> and restructuring the tax code and all of that, but just immediately stop the growth of the spending. You know, not not reduce the growth of spending. That seems to be a big freeze one. It. Yeah, but absolutely freeze it. Do not grow it. Now I know there's some things that grow, you know, social security payments, whatnot. You know, there's probably gonna be some things that, that have to grow by virtue of the, 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 the program needs to grow. But that's that's by far you know the exception of I think your advice is very well taken, and in fact, in both the House and the Senate, there's been legislation recently called the Cut, Cap, and Balance legislation that we've all supported here to try to achieve the same objective you're talking about. In the Gang of Six negotiations, putting those limits and caps on the spending to literally freeze or control in out years, the, the, the growth below the rate of growth of the economy are things that are under active negotiation right now. But that kind of solution that you've suggested is what we need to do. And I will just say that in contrast to that, what we've seen Congress and the President do in the last three years is increase the spending by over 25% in the discretionary budget, if I have the numbers right. And uh, so we, we are going, we are screaming in exactly the wrong direction, and your suggestion is exactly the kind of approach we ought to be considering as we consider our budget solutions.